speaker. So uh, I'm going to give you guys a hand again. Great job. It's very informative. Thank I'm you. glad we have this uh, multinational, multi-continent presence. So thanks so much. So, uh, so, so we're, you know, so before 2008, probably 70% of our content was hedge funds. And since then, it's probably declined. We're probably 70% private equity in real estate these days. Um, but I'll, I'll give you some numbers uh, on the hedge fund space. So we were really lucky in 2008, uh, you know, we came across Paskowitz Asset Management and Brad Paskowitz, real smart guy, uh, Princeton guy, and um, he was running a CTA and it was one of the top performers of the year. So it was like a top 10 performer. And uh, they did about 38% that year when the market, I mean, the average hedge fund was probably down 40% and the average fund was down 60%. Um, the next year we had Barnegat Fund, which is a, a great fund out of uh, Hoboken. They've got a very interesting um, um, strategy, uh, highly leveraged about 30X. So uh, the fund we have speaking today is Gammon Capital and Mike Mesher. And Mike, can you tell us how much your fund is up this year? I haven't checked the P&L in the last couple of days, but I would say it's probably on the order of about 600% still. Great. Fantastic. So Mike, can you talk to us about Gammon Capital, what your strategy is and go from there? I'm not sure if you have a slideshow or not, but uh, feel free to share it with us. Uh, sure. No slideshow, but happy to just sit and talk. Am I on the video here or just audio? Yes. Uh, you look good. Oh, okay. Great. I can't see anything. I uh, can't see myself. Uh, so first off, thanks for having me, Marty. I appreciate it. I kind of wish I could be there with you, but today after 13 years is the day that I am channeling Snake Plissken and I am escaping New York after this call. So I'm looking forward to that. But before that, I figured we'd sit and we would talk a little bit about trading and what we've accomplished this year and more importantly, where we're going forward and how we're going to be positioning. So just as a quick background before we get started. Gammon Capital is a derivatives trading fund, and we specialize in the application of machine learning to the options market. About a year and a half ago, we started the Tailwind offering with a single investor who put up $4 million, and that account's currently worth about $25 million. bucks. So like I said, today we're going to talk about how we accomplished that, and we're going to talk about how we're positioning ourselves going forward. Uh, before that, though, I've always maintained that when reviewing hedge funds and talking to people about different strategies, it's more important to recognize that you're buying a manager as opposed to a strategy. Strategies come and go, and you need to know that your manager has the ability to evolve and innovate with the markets. So before we start getting into exactly the way that we're positioning, I'll give you a quick background on who I am. So about 20 years ago, I began my trading career in the pits of the CDOE. And prior to starting my own firm a couple of years ago, I was the head of special situations volatility trading at Lehman Barclays and also a partner at Ronin Capital. I'm the son of an entrepreneurial engineer and I've always had an affinity for building machines. And I was also fortunate enough to have a natural aptitude for probability and statistics. So making the move into trading and finance was kind of a natural path for me. I've always really liked how the financial models are really just machines, but they're more cerebral machines. And the market offers instant feedback on the quality of your machines. Remember when I was coming up, a lot of people always said that when it comes to P&L swings on any given day, you can't really think about the dollars, but you think about it more in terms of a scorecard. And I think that's kind of the way that we think about it. You know, there's kind of comes a point when you're not really doing this for the money anymore, but you're more doing it to see what you're capable of. And that's kind of where we're at right now with the firm. So speaking of where we're at right now, let's talk about where we're at in the markets. I've heard a lot of people sit and they opine on the market, they'll say the market's going up for this reason and the market's going down for this reason. And I think one of the important things when you're running a fund is it's very difficult to make these directional calls and consistently get them right. I mean, if anybody could consistently get the direction right, they should be the richest person on the planet. So we don't really sit and opine on market direction. But one thing that we will opine on is the distribution of prices. And something that we've really noticed this year on the back end of coronavirus is the tails in the market have gotten significantly fatter. And there's a handful of reasons for that. One of them is obviously the coronavirus and the potential uptick that's coming this autumn and the winter. We haven't really done a great job as a country on managing the coronavirus and it's not really clear how we're gonna do going forward. So that has the potential to bite us. That's kind of one of the left-hand tails. 
Also, obviously, the elections. Uh, I don't think a peaceful transition of power is a given by any stretch of the imagination. So any sort of uh, conflict there could certainly lead to a tail event. Also, on the right-hand tail, you have the Fed continuing to print money and the inevitable inflation that's coming. That adds to the tail risk. And then also there's a special situation that we've identified that we believe is the next black swan. I'll touch on that in a little bit, but that also represents one of the big fatter tails in the market. So I guess one of the things we ought to talk about is what makes us different as a firm. And a lot of that really comes down to the process. When you're building a firm from the ground up, you have an opportunity to review everything and question why things are done the way they're done. It's kind of like when Elon started Tesla, he basically sat and said, why do we do this in cars? You don't just do something because that's the way it's done. That's the way the errors get made. That's the way that you can be inefficient. You have to question everything you're doing as you're building it. So we did that from the ground up and there's probably five things as I was thinking about this that make us significantly different from everybody else out there. I would say the first thing, and this is one of the important things, is the majority of products that we traffic in have a natural value destruction. So that really contrasts with a lot of the guys out there who are doing equity long short books on specific stocks and trying to say the stock's undervalued, that stuff's overvalued. What we're doing is we're looking at exchange traded products. And these products are getting more complicated. And if you start to understand how these machines work, a lot of them have features built in that create value destruction. Now, these features could be some sort of rolling mechanism if it's a constant maturity product, or maybe it's leverage embedded in the product. But the important thing is, if you take a look at the historical prices for a lot of the assets that we traffic in, these are assets that are converging to zero. They will inevitably reverse split, and they will continue to move towards zero because there's some sort of nuance or some sort of mechanism embedded in that exchange traded product that just destroys value over time. So by trafficking in those products, we already have a natural tailwind in terms of where the stock is ultimately gonna go. And then it's really just a function of being able to capture the correct risk reward on that. I would say a second thing that makes us a lot different is we traffic in the option space. And trafficking in the option space is nothing new. There's some people who do that. But one of the things that makes it a lot different. Hi. Hi. Good. How are you? I, I'm well. Is uh, is it all right? Audrey. Um, sorry, I'm at work. Uh, would something like 1:30 work for you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead. Sorry about this. Um, one of the other things that makes us a lot different is we do something that we would refer to as higher dimensional trading. And when you think about professional volatility traders out of there, I would say about 99% of people, myself included prior to starting our firm, do things the same way. And specifically what that means is in the option space, you have a lot of different risks that you traffic in. And one of those is obviously directional risk. So for example, let's say you buy a call, you're naturally long the market. But when you're a professional volatility trader, what you'll do is you'll strip out that directional risk. So if you absorb directional risk on a trade, you hedge it out with directional risk. And every type of risk that you're assuming as a professional vol trader, you're typically hedging that out with a similar type of risk. We do something a little bit more innovative that we call the higher dimensional trading. And we trade those different types of risk against other different types of risk. So let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about here. In the volatility space, a lot of people like to go out and sell volatility. It's kind of the easy trade. It usually makes money for a while until it doesn't. And the big problem is if you're short vol, inevitably you blow up. So we try to think about how can you capture the edge in a short volatility trade without blowing up? And the resulting position might be something like this. Let's imagine that you wanted to get long a straddle on the S&P, but you don't really wanna pay the bleed that comes in, loan, in owning options. So what we would do, as opposed to buying a put and a call on the S&P, is we would buy a put on the S&P, but then to get our bullish exposure on the market, we would go buy a put on the VIX. Now, if you take a look at that, buying a put on the VIX is a little bit tricky. Are you long volatility or short volatility in that trade? The answer is you're short first order volatility. You want volatility to go down, but because you're buying options on this product, you're long second order volatility. So effectively, what this gives you is a position where you have bearish market risk by way of your S&P put, 
and bullish market risk by way of your VIX put. If nothing happens, volatility goes down, and ideally the money that you make on your VIX put outweighs the losses on your S&P put. Similarly, if the market continues to rally, the VIX put should outperform and cover your losses on the S&P put, and if the market ends up crashing, that S&P put will end up paying off and cover the losses on your VIX put. So this is a way that we're able to capture a short volatility position, but be exclusively long options and long tail everywhere, so that when the inevitable market blow up happens like coronavirus, we do exceptionally well there. So in a situation like that, what we're doing is we're hedging directional risk with volatility risk. And in changing the different types of risk and hedging them against each other, we're able to unlock a lot of different value. It's the type of thing that kind of makes sense, but people just don't really do that because that's just not the way things are done. If you look at any volatility trading textbook, they're gonna tell you to go the old school way of hedging risk with the exact same type of risk because when all of these treatises were written, none of these new advanced products existed. But now with these new advanced product suites, we have the ability to get a lot more done. I would say a third thing that makes us a lot different is I mentioned that we do a little bit of machine learning. And in the machine learning world, there's something called the fitness function. And I've seen a lot of machine learning specialists on Wall Street, but I've never heard anyone talk about the fitness function. I don't understand why, because it's one of the most important things there is. Namely, what the fitness function does is it allows the user to define what the most important investing objectives to them are. So for example, you might have your first investor who says, I only care about absolute returns. I wanna have the biggest number possible. You might have a second investor who says, I just wanna win a lot. I want a high win loss ratio. That's most important to me. And then you might have a third guy who says, well, I care a third about mathematical advantage a third about risk-adjusted returns, and a third on the win-loss ratio. So understanding what someone's investing objectives are, when you have machine learning available as a tool for you, you can quantify those investing objectives, and then you can use your machine learning algorithms to go out and comb through the entire universe of options trades that are available, and you can instantly identify what the best trades are for your specific strategy. That's really important because a lot of the hedge funds out there, they just basically jam their strategy down your throat and you have to hope it's a fit. Whereas- I gotta ask you some questions about this machine learning strategy. Yeah, but sure. So are you saying that you can actually tailor your strategy for each person? And does that require then a separately managed accounts for each one? Sure. Or is it all part of the one fund somehow? So kind of both. To the degree that you wanna go super custom and you have a very specific type of risk that you wanna work with, then that would be a managed account because that's very specific to you. But when you come into the fund, basically we talk about what our desirability index and what our fitness function is. And typically we find that that's a pretty good fit for most investors, especially when investors aren't used to being able to highly customize what they're doing. Gotcha, okay, keep on going. Uh, so I would say another thing that makes us a little bit different, and there's some other funds out there that are doing this, but this carries a little bit more weight when you're able to put up triple digit returns is to the degree that you live in a state like New York or California or Massachusetts or just a state that's not very tax friendly, we have the ability to wrap this strategy up into certain account structures and offer you tax-free status on this, whether you're an onshore investor or offshore. So needless to say, that's incredibly important when you start moving with really big return numbers. And then I would say the fifth thing that is making- I'm sorry, I had to interrupt you. Is that through self-directed account? Uh, so that would be something more along the lines of an IDF. So if you're taking a look at PPLI or PPVA or any of those types of vehicles. So in a case like that, they would place money with us and then we would go and we would manage that money for them. And then they would get the tax-free status on that. And they would also have access to that money by way of taking loans out against their own policy. We can get into that. I mean, one of, one of the structures we've talked about in the past in this group has been uh, having a big enough, uh, you know, uh, not like a $50 million or more separately managed account where you're kind of managing that as a tax advantage, you know, fund. Yeah, yeah, we're able to do that. So that's again, something that's specific to whoever the client is, we're able to work with them on that specifically. Yep, yep. And okay. then, the fifth and last thing that I wanted to hit on that makes us a lot different, and this is actually one of the scariest things I've seen in my 20 year career, is in the special situation space, let me take a step back before I tell you about this. 
Prior to starting my own firm, I ran special situations, volatility trading at Lehman and then subsequently Barclays when Lehman went under. And a lot of that has to do with tail risk. And options are a great vehicle for tail risk because you're able to get a lot of leverage and you can really put up some impressive returns in tail situations in addition to being able to just manage your risk better. So let's talk about risk in the market. We just went through coronavirus. This is probably one of the biggest supply and demand shocks that we've ever seen on the globe. But if you ask the stock market if anything was wrong, the answer is clearly no. It seems like everything's just fine. Intuitively, we all know that that's not the case. That doesn't make any sense. And we've come across a special situation that's something that we're starting to put a lot of effort into right now. So I'm just gonna give you a little teaser on it and also a warning because there's a storm coming and this could easily be one of the worst storms maybe in the history of finance. We'd see, I don't wanna overpromise quite yet, but I am gonna read you a sentence from a piece of legislation that is currently law. During the applicable period, blank may elect to suspend generally accepted accounting principles. What I'm telling you right now is that there are entire sections of the US economy that have thrown out gap. There are numerous players cooking the books right now. There is a defined endpoint when they are no longer able to do this. When the rubber hits the road, everyone's gonna see what's really happening. That's coming soon, and if you're not ready for it, it will be catastrophic for you. So to the degree that you are interested in taking a look closer look at this, and if you'd like to know exactly who's cooking the books and when this applicable period's over and how we're levering our upside while maintaining fixed downside on these types of trades, I'd encourage you all to reach out after the conference, and we'd be more than happy to discuss. So two questions I have. Um, I'm, I'm going to want you to elucidate more on this coming storm, but that's my second question. But my, my first question is, so you said in your strategy 